Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's Adult Issues webinar series on navigating the transition to college for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. My name is Jill Harris, and I'm the clinical liaison at the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, also known as NJ ACE. NJ ACE is a statewide, innovative, comprehensive, and collaborative network to promote quality research, professional training, and to build public awareness aimed to improve the lives of individuals with autism across the lifespan. The center is funded by a grant from the New Jersey Governor's Council for Medical Research and Treatment of Autism to Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, in partnership with Children's Specialized Hospital. To learn more about NJ ACE, resources, and goals, please visit our website at www.njace.us. This Adult Issues webinar series is designed to build understanding and skills of people with autism from transition to adulthood through aging. The series is intended for adults with autism, families, friends, service providers, and the general community. Topics and experts were chosen based on input from various stakeholders, including autistic adults, caregivers, and providers. Some things to remember as we continue. On the right side of your browser, you'll see a chat box that might look something like this. In order to participate in the YouTube live chat, you must sign into your Google or YouTube account. Here is what the sign in button looks like for both desktop and mobile YouTube clients. Once you click on that button, YouTube should redirect you to the appropriate login page and afterward will redirect you back to the live stream where you can now chat and ask questions to our presenters. As time permits, the presenters will address your questions at the end of their presentations. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording of this webinar will be provided on our website, njace.us, under the Resources, Webinars by NJACE tab at a later date. Please check back in a few days for the recording and feel free to share with anyone. We'll also be putting a webinar evaluation link on the YouTube live chat box for participants to complete. The evaluations really help us gauge trainers and topics for future webinars, so please fill them out. The evaluation is also on our website under the Resources, Webinars by NJAs tab for you to fill out there as well. With that, we're very pleased to welcome our speakers for today, Nancy Tishner and Sean Killian. Nancy is a New Jersey and Morris County native. She earned her degree from Montclair State University and began her career in education in New Orleans during the rebuilding of schools following Hurricane Katrina. Prior to working with College Steps, Nancy worked as a K-12 special educator and teacher leader in various schools. College Steps is a nonprofit that partners with colleges to provide individualized college support for students with social communication and learning challenges. The primary goal of College Steps is to prepare students for meaningful careers and autonomy after graduation. As program coordinator on the County College of Morris, for the County College of Morris, Nancy supports students with self-advocacy, employment, and independent living skills as they transition to post-secondary life. She manages peer mentors to support students in building an atmosphere of academic dignity and integ integration. She believes in equal accessibility to college experiences for all. The College Steps program at the County College of Morris supports college students for whom navigating college is challenged by social, academic, or independent living barriers. Our other speaker, Sean, is a self-advocate who just completed his first year of college on the campus of the County College of Morris. He is currently pursuing a certificate in computer science while being supported by peer mentors through College Steps. Welcome, Nancy and Sean. Hello, welcome everyone. Today, uh, myself and Sean will be talking about navigating the transition to college for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Um, we're gonna be talking about what students and families need to know about the post-secondary transition. Um, I am Nancy Tishner. I am the College Steps Program Coordinator, and I have with me today Sean Killian, who is one of our College Steps students, and this was his first year of college. So I am a special educator. I started my career in New Orleans post Hurricane Katrina, helping to um, create uh, new and better special education systems for students. And I also worked in K through 12 education in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and I work for College Steps. We help transition students from high school to college. Um, and I am on the campus of the County College of Morris. So I support students with self-advocacy, employment, independent living skills as they transition to post-secondary life. 
Um, and I have with me here today, Sean. Um, Sean is a college step student. As I said, this is his first, he just finished his first year of college and he's gonna talk a little bit about himself. Yeah. So as you said, Vincent, my name is Sean Killian. I just completed my first year of college on the campus of the County College of Morris. I am currently pursuing a certificate in computer science while being supported by peer mentors through college steps. So today, um, I'm going to be providing kind of the service provider parent perspective, um, and Sean will be filling us in on what it's like to experience this transition as an actual student. Um, so a little bit about College Steps, because both Sean and I are part of our organization. We provide uh, hands-on and personalized college support for students with all learning and social challenges. Our mantra, Build Your Future, represents a student-centered support system. And we actually use peer mentoring um, to support students on campus. So we hire other college students to support students in our program in navigating all of these new systems that pop up once you transition to any college campus. Um, we provide structured educational support. Um, our award winning mo model emphasizes thorough planning, thoughtful action, constant reporting, and comprehensive management. Along with our expert team, student mentors are the center of our approach. And we are on a growing number of college campuses across the country. Access to a college depth experience provides high school students and first year college students with an introduction to campus culture and classes and college students ongoing support as they work toward a degree. I always say that what we provide here at College Steps is something that all students, all college students could potentially need. But we do specifically work with a large population of people who identify as having autism. And we were founded by a clinical psychologist and a special educator to empower students living with learning and social challenges through structured post-secondary support. What we found is that students were transitioning from high school to college and they were going from a system that provided them with a lot of support to a system that wasn't providing them with very much support at all. So a lot of Sean and I's experiences come through working with college chefs on a college campus and providing those sports, supports that many students find are, are missing when they start their college education. So today we're going to go over three main objectives. Our goal for everyone joining us on the webinar today is to help support students, parents, and other service providers and understanding the differences between high school and college supports. We're also going to discuss how important it is for students to operate independently on a college campus and provide you with some tips on how to support students who are making that transition. And we're gonna outline how parents and other team members can support students in that, uh, in reaching towards more independence. So if you, key things to keep in mind about the transition to college is there are different expectations. There are different disability laws. There's very strict confidentiality. Self-advocacy and communication are key. And there are no resource classes or modified classwork. So we're going to go through this in a little bit more detail on the slides that follow. So one thing I always keep in mind as a, a support person um, on the campus of a college and something I always try to make sure I'm coaching parents and other support team members on is that our students uh, are going to be accessing a system that works very differently than the high school system. Uh, K through 12 education is very focused on providing the supports, the individualized supports for students to meet their individualized goals. But on a college campus, students are expected to meet the same expectations as their peers. And this is true in many different areas, academic achievement, social integration, independent living, pre-employment transition services. And just like all students have different motives for attending college, students who identify as having autism also have similar Different, differing motives for attending college. Some students just want to take a few courses to boost their skills. Others may be working towards an actual certificate to add up to the resume in a specific area, such as computer science or culinary arts. This is mostly found at community colleges. Or students might be at college to earn a degree. 
some college students, especially freshmen, <laughs> might not know at all yet if college is really for them and what their next step in life is, but they wanna try it out and they wanna see if it works for them. So any student with a disability has the same range of choices and the same right to not really know what their main goal is for college, but they just need to know they wanna try it out. So Sean, when you first started, when you first signed up for CCM, the County College of Morris, and College Steps, what were your motives for trying out college? When I first attended college, my main goal was to do classes and gain experience and see if college worked for me. Last year, I found out that college worked for me. I have the new goal of working towards a certificate for web development. Yeah. So Sean, just like many other college students, whether they identify as having a disability or not, um, Sean had a very similar experience to most freshmen. He tried it out at first. He knew it was something he was interested in. And now he knows it's for him. And he now has more concrete goals through going through the experience of his first year of college. A year ago, he wasn't sure if he wanted a degree. And now it's something that he's very passionate about and working towards. I have other students who still aren't sure, but that's the same for any college student. So when we're thinking about supporting students making this transition, and as Sean's parents and I supported him in making his transition, we thought about college as being in these four different areas. I think something we tend to forget is college is not just academic achievement. It's not just a successful completion of coursework required for a job training certificate or degree. Obviously, that's a very large part, and that should be one of your major motives for going to college, but it isn't the only part. Many people attend college for the social integration, meeting new people and expanding your social network. Getting jobs out of college is very dependent on who you met and what experiences you had socially through your experience in college. It's also two to four years of learning how to live on your own as an adult, which is huge for anybody in the ages of 18 to 21. And this can look like living in your dorm or even how do you start to live more like an adult within your current household. And college is an authentic experience in learning some of the skills that People have tried to teach you in isolation in independent living courses in the K through 12 environment. But once you're in college, you actually have to do these things for real. So a lot of learning happens in this area in your college years. And then of course, there's the pre-employment and transition services. You're building your resume in college. You're gaining skills and job experiences through internships or through working with a specific professor or through actually getting a job that aligns to your interests and you're trying to make yourself more marketable for your desired field. Most colleges actually do provide built-in support in each of these areas for all of their students. For example, on campus, you're gonna find that academics already have advisors built in, depending on your major. There's already going to be a tutoring center on most college campuses. Most professors are teaching in a way that has built-in class support. If you find a college that's the right fit for you, you might find that professors are already individualizing their education, your education based on what they know about you. And there's usually an accessibility or disability services department that's specifically catered towards people who want more support in using accommodations for things like tests and exams. In terms of social integration, most colleges offer a freshman orientation or some sort of summer program where freshmen are asked to come to campus before the rest of the community so that they can live on the dorm and learn what it's like to be a college student and also get to know the other people who are the same age as them or starting the program at the same time. There's also an, typically an office of student life whose entire mission on campus is to create social experiences that are safe and engaging and enriching for students. Most college campuses have a wide variety of clubs that are run by other students. And then there's also more and more college campuses are creating mentoring programs for specific groups. 
So for example, College Steps is on the campus of the County College of Morris, and we provide mentoring to people with disabilities. But there are other mentoring programs typically in a campus. For example, if you are identified as a minority, or if you're a first-generation college student, colleges frequently have their own mentoring programs. And even if College Steps isn't on a specific campus, there are lots of growing number of colleges across the country that have a similar program as College Steps to help support people who identify as being part of specific groups. For independent living, most colleges already provide dorm resident advisors who are upperclassmen who will advise you on the even the small teeny tiny things that we don't think about when we think about living on our own as a college student. So what happens if you don't get along with your roommate or someone else on your floor? Resident advisors are there to kind of help you walk through that. And then also for pre-employment, almost all college campuses have some sort of career services department with career counselors who are gonna be able to help you with your resume and building those skills you need to actually get a job after college. But there's also within majors, depending on your major, plenty of internship opportunities or volunteer opportunities, work studying and networking. As you get to know people in your major and professors in your major, more and more job opportunities pop up. So um, back to Sean, what was, and when you think about these four main areas, what was your biggest challenge area and where do you feel you grew the most in your first year? My biggest challenge areas were academics and organization in my first year. I, I grew I grew the most in social integration. I started with joining my first club of a mentor at, in my first semester. I joined two new clubs by myself by a second semester and was even asked to be the president of one of the clubs. I also did make progress in academics, earning A's in both my courses. I will continue to work on organization where I tend to struggle the most. So what did you learn about organization? What was something you developed with your mentors through College Steps that you didn't have before that you do use now? Using planners and making sure I have concrete time set for everything in the order of and what level of priority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of those soft skills that people don't think about needing outside of being able to read and write and do math well is staying organized and having systems and routines in place for keeping track of all those due dates. So that's super important. So when you're first starting to think about college, you're making a transition from K through 12 special education into the college level system. And there are a few key, key differences that are really hard to navigate um, as you make that transition. So we're going to overview the legal aspects of this transition because you are changing from one set of laws to another. Um, just to give everybody an, um, a deeper understanding of why it is different, because um, that is frequently a question that I have parents or advocates or students ask is why um, these things are that were we had in K through 12 education are not in place in college. So we're going to go through the background of all of that. So in college, there um, is no IDEA. Um, IDEA is a K through 12 special education law. And whether you've heard that term or not, it is the law that provided um, you or your student with an individualized education plan or an IEP. So IDEA provided you also with a case manager and that's where those yearly meetings were happening because of this law. And IDEA is an education act to provide federal financial assistance to state and local education agencies to guarantee special education and related services to eligible children with disabilities. So pretty much all of us as Americans, as attending school in the USA, we are entitled to receive a free and appropriate public education under the age of 18. And IDEA is an extra law built in to ensure that all people, regardless of disability, all children receive that K through 12 education. 
colleges fall under ADA, which is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination solely on the basis of disability in employment, public services, and accommodations. So most people, when they think of ADA, they think of wheelchair accessibility. A lot of people understand that a library needs to have a ramp as well as a stairs um, or an elevator in order for people who are physically disabled to navigate public buildings or a workplace. But ADA actually goes far beyond that and it protects all people with disabilities. And it removes any discrimination. Similarly how, to how other civil rights laws work, you cannot not offer employment to someone simply based on their sex or their race. ADA is protecting people. They are qualified for the position. You cannot refuse a public service or a, employment or reasonable accommodations simply because they have a disability. And then there's 504. 504 covers both K through 12 and colleges, but it's also a little bit different in the way it's used in those different areas. It's a civil rights law to prohibit discrimination on um, the basis of disability in programs, activities, public and private, that receive federal financial assistance. So very similar to IDEA, ADA, that's why you hear a pop up in both of these places. So we'll be mostly focusing today on IDEA and ADA because that's where most of the differences come from. But what does this look like in the everyday experience for someone who's transitioning to college or their parents or advocates or team members? So basically there are no IEPs or 504 plans in college. That's the biggest difference. Nobody is creating an individualized plan in order to ensure that you are successful in college. The federal law that covers uh, college students is ADA and some sections of 504. Another big difference is students must reestablish their eligibility for disability services under ADA. So uh, you can use many of the same uh, documentation from your K through 12 education that was used for your IEP, um, but you will have to kind of go through the process again. And we'll talk through what that looks like in later slides. And another important uh, piece of information is that students default to the college laws and systems, even if they're still receiving services from high school. So we have some students um, who are 18 to 21 who still qualify for services from their public school system through IDEA. But the second you walk onto a college campus, you fall under ADA. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. So IDEA focuses on the schools and supports. What must they provide to an individual child to make sure they're successful? But ADA covers college students to, and make sure that they are provided with access to post-secondary education through reasonable accommodations. IDEA is more focused on successful completion of individual goals due to the school's adequate provision of a free and appropriate education to meet the unique needs of a specific child. But when a student transitions from K through 12 to the post-secondary system, they are shifting from an entitlement system to an eligibility system. So that is where a lot of the differences are coming from. K through 12 schools are legally obligated to ensure you receive your education. Whereas college, you are, we are putting supports in place to make sure you are eligible to access accommodations, but it is not the school's responsibility to make sure that you are successful. So well, now we're going to go in a little bit more about the differences between IDA versus ADA so you understand um, why uh, the, it works a little bit differently between the two systems. If you're interested in learning more about the legal aspects here, you can find more information on the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund website, DREDF. They go into much more depth about the differences between these laws. 
First, the big difference is the different definitions of disability. IDEA applies to children ages 3 to 21 who are determined by a multidisciplinary team to be eligible within one or more 13 of one or more of 13 specific disability categories. So those are the evaluations that students went through about every three years in their K through 12 experience, where the school psychologist, the case manager, general education teachers, um, the, your doctor would help the student participate in tests to determine if they still qualify for special education because they have a disability. The definition under IDEA is a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or in using language, spoken or written, that may manifest itself in the imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or to do mathematical calculations. But in ADA, the definition of a disability is a legal term, not medical. And it protects any individual with a disability who, one, has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more life activities, or two, has a record of such impairment, or three, is regarded as having such an impairment. Further, the person must be qualified for the program, service, or job. So ADA is pretty much saying that, this, that what we're going to look at is whether the, student, the person is otherwise qualified for a position outside of their disability, and then accommodations will be provided. Whereas in IDEA, we're going to provide the accommodations in order to ensure that the student is successful. So otherwise qualified is the language included in ADA. It means that a person is qualified to participate in a specific program, perform a job or service, and cannot be disqualified solely because they have a disability. And it ensures people with disabilities are not denied job or education opportunities unless they are actually unable to do the job. So they're not qualified for it outside of their disability. FAPE is a free and appropriate public education, and it's entitled to all children. IDEA ensures that all children receive their free appropriate education, even if they have a unique challenge that prevents them from accessing their education the way that other people do. Another key difference between the two laws is substantial limitation versus relative weakness. ADA can only be applied when a disability substantially limits an individual's ability. Students qualified for IDEA funding when there is a pattern of weakness as it relates to their disability. The fourth key difference is equal access versus reasonable accommodation. ADA can only be applied when a, uh, sorry, equal access, let me do that again. So another key difference is equal access and reasonable accommodation. Equal access, IDA ensures all students receive a free and appropriate education re regardless of their weaknesses or their difficulties. Whereas IDA provides reasonable accommodation. ADA ensures people with disabilities receive reasonable accommodations to access programs, jobs, or services they would otherwise be able to. The emphasis there is on reasonable accommodations. So whereas IDEA is saying no matter what, a school, the teachers, the principal have to provide this student with their free and appropriate education, no matter what's going on. Whereas ADA considers the obligations of the college and only puts on them a, uh, an, and a burden of reasonable, reasonable accommodation. And colleges, as well as other public organizations that are fall under ADA, um, receive the right to undue administrative burden. So this means that it protects them from significant difficulty or expense to their program, service, or employer. And they are not required to provide a service if it creates an undue burden. So that's all the legal aspects of the differences between these two laws. But what does this actually look like? for a student who's making this transition. So the first uh, difference, key difference in a student's day-to-day -day life is there's very strict confidentiality on a college campus and privacy guidelines. So in high school, all members of the student's IEP team had the responsibility 
to read and reinforce students' documentation in order to support them in achieving their IEP goals. But in college, the laws change to protecting the student's privacy. And so professors receive a very limited amount of information, usually just about the accommodations they need to receive for tests. And the student is responsible for providing that information to their professors. Many colleges have their own procedures for how students do this in partnership with the, their Office of Disability Services or Accessibility Services. And so when a student starts college, they want to first contact that office on their college campus to find out what the procedure is and so that they can be supported in doing that. They're not completely on their own, but it is their responsibility to report to their professors the accommodations that they would like to receive for um, tests. And the Office of Accessibility Services and Disability Services on campus will also help the student identify what they're eligible for, and they have paperwork for all of that as well. This also gives students the right to change their mind. Most students will set up this at the beginning of the semester, but if they decide in, on any particular test or exam that they don't want to receive their accommodations, that's their prerogative and they can choose to not receive them. Students must both self-identify and self-report in each class for which they want accommodations. So again, each college and each office of accessibility or disability services has their own procedure for doing this. But pretty much what it looks like at most college campuses is some sort of meeting with the Accessibility Services Department at the beginning of the semester, filling out a series of paperwork, and then having some form of bringing that to your professor. And then they might also have a procedure for signing up for tests and exams at that office so that you can actually receive your accommodations. But at any point for any class, the student can decide that they don't want to self-report, and that's their right to choose not to receive the accommodations for that class. So that first piece is huge. When students are going from a system where teachers would come to their classroom and pull them out to receive their accommodations. Teachers were the ones responsible for reading through their paperwork and making sure that they knew what the student's disability was and what their needs are. And now the student is responsible for making the decision about who they want to have that information and providing that information to them. Huge shift for any 18 to 21 year old. Another big difference, and this is uh, a one that's very difficult, especially if you're a student or a student you're supporting participated in resource or a modified curriculum in their K through 12 education. In college, there are no special classes or special ed labels. There are no waivers of essential course program or requirements, and there's no shortening or other changes to assignments or assessments. So if you look at your IEP or your student's IEP and you notice modifications, IEPs provide accommodations, which are uh, things like short and uh, extra time for tests, taking it in a small group, pretty much anything related to specializing the setting of a test. Those accommodations in most cases are provided in college. What's not provided is anything listed in the IEP as a modification. So modifications are changes to the curriculum, not accommodations or changes to the environment during test taking. And this is because ADA specifies that a person with a disability is, again, going back to that language from the previous slide, otherwise qualified to participate. So this requires that the student be able to engage in the course material to the same level as their non-disabled peers. And when provided with those reasonable accommodations, again, mentioned in the law, they should be able to be successful in the same way as their peers. So that's the reasoning for a lot of these differences. So again, we're getting kind of into legal land. This is the way it is. This is the what it looks like. So what does it look like for an individual student? So Sean. When, in the past year, when you were on a college campus, did you complete all the same assignments as the other people in your class? Yes, I completed the same assignments as the other students, and I 
my classes in both my first and second semesters. Was there ever an assignment you were worried you wouldn't be able to complete? Yes, there were some assignments I was nervous about at first, such as the group project for my computer concepts class. My mentors and my mom helped me prepare for that by making a plan and stay, staying organized when that day came. Great. And um, anything else you did to help you handle like the stress of having to complete all of the requirements of that assignment? So just being sure I understood everything and slowing down and making sure I give myself enough time to study and get it done. Great. So one advantage of most college classes in college classrooms is that um, you know what the due dates are up ahead. So Sean knew himself well enough and knew that he was going to need the extra time. So he asked his uh, support people to help him navigate that extra time and make sure that it was getting done. So even though he had more requirements to complete than maybe he was used to from his previous education experiences, he had the skills and the support system he needed to navigate that. Um, and what steps did you take at the beginning of the semester here at the County College of Morris to receive your accommodations? What, what pro well, process did you have to follow? Well, first I talked to Maria Schiano at Accessibility Services to discuss which accommodations I would like to have. After that, I had to fill out a form for each class I am taking staying my accommodations, which has to be given to and signed by a professor before returning to accessibility services. If I wanted to take a test with accessibility services, I had to set up an appointment with them. This required me to bring a form that also has to be approved by a professor. Great. And um, something that Sean's mom as her as his support person helped him with was making sure that when he went into that accessibility services meeting, he had the necessary documentation to prove that he needed those reasonable accommodations. That's correct. Um, and then some accessibility services departments do recognize the parent's involvement at this point in a student's life, especially a student with a disability. So parents may be able to attend those meetings. So that's something that you can ask about. But even though um, Sean had myself as uh, part of the program and his mom there, the meeting was led by him. The questions were directed to him. Um, and then he had to follow through with the next steps. So that was a lot of work on your end to make sure that you received your accommodations, right? Yes, but it was what, worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. What did you have to do? What systems did you have in place to make sure you remembered all that and it all got done? Well, well, versa Dewson is do it as soon, do it as soon as possible. Like one of those told me, do it as soon as you figure it out. Otherwise, I'm gonna, for, I'm going to forget it, which I will forget it if I do that. And then you also wrote it down in your agenda. Yes. Right. And you needed some support with remembering to take those steps, right? Yes. So having other support people who know the process is super helpful. You can they can provide reminders, you know, check in at the end of the day to make sure that those steps were followed, you know, and, and teaching you how to use your agenda system. So even though you were on your own, you had support behind the scenes. Right. And that's how a lot of support will need to happen is behind the scenes. How do you empower the student with skills and tools and support to follow through on these steps on their own? So now that we've reviewed some of the key differences between uh, K through 12 and college, uh, how do you start planning for college? How do you get started? How do you look for a college that's right for you? And then how do you navigate these day-to-day -day differences? So the most important piece of advice I can give um, as a support person is support development of self-navigation self-advocacy and independent living skills. Um, it's a lot, what we just reviewed, it's a lot to deal with in your first year. So as much as possible as part of the transition plan, starting as, as young as middle school, making sure students have these skills to self-advocate, to keep an agenda, to keep track of um, things that they have to do on their own, to lead their own meetings. Um, these are super important skills that 
if the student doesn't start engaging in them until they're in college, they're dealing with it right off the bat and they don't have the same supports or same backup systems that they would in a K through 12 environment. And the way parents and support team members can do this is through supported decision making. Um, the number one determinant of college success for anyone, but especially for students who identify as having a disability, is the student's willingness to try it out. You don't have to be someone who is, I'm getting a degree and I'm going to major in this and I'm going to get all A's, but you also can't go to college and not want to be there. So it's super important that this decision is the students and not anybody else's. And the way that your team can support is not by making decisions for them, but supporting them in making their own decisions about college. Student members, students team members should allow the student to be in the driver's seat. They should, the student should lead meetings, complete steps, and Create systems amongst yourself and your parent or your other team members to ask for support as needed. Students should be the one filling out their applications, requesting paperwork, um, going through those steps with someone in the, in the background to kind of coach them through it. In terms of actually making the decision about uh, what you want your support to look like, a good topic of conversation to have with your parents or other support people, or if you are a parent or support person, have this conversation with the student. Discuss what mistakes you're comfortable making on your own. Um, you cannot avoid making mistakes. It's going to happen. That's part of life. Um, and I think a lot of the K through 12 education system, um, for better or worse, tries to avoid uh, failure for the student. And that's just the way that system's designed. It's what a lot of students need. But if you're ready to commit to the next step of college, there are going to be moments of stress. There are going to be moments of failure. There are going to be moments of mistakes. But nothing is impossible to, to fix later if the, per, if the student has a support system. So maybe there are mistakes that will be too, will bring too much anxiety. The student doesn't want to do those, make those mistakes. So they will want to consult with their parent or support team members before they make a decision, before they do something. But maybe there are other mistakes they're comfortable making. Maybe they're okay with filling out a form wrong. Maybe they're okay with registering for a class late accidentally. Maybe they're okay with getting a lower grade the first time, but they want to try it out on their own, and that's super important to them. So having that conversation before these things pop up allows parents and other support people to kind of loosen the reins and be like, okay, he's going to be okay if this happens. When you're thinking about making the actual de decision about what college to attend, um, you definitely are gonna wanna do, have the student do their own research or support them in leading the own, their own work research. And you wanna evaluate important resources. So you wanna learn, you know, on a college tour, if you go to your regular standard college tour, you're gonna learn about student life, you're gonna learn about the professors, you're gonna learn about the class sizes. But as someone identifying as having autism, you're gonna to have to dig a little bit deeper. You're gonna to have to ask about disability services. You're maybe gonna to wanna to meet with someone from that office before you make your final decision. Um, if you have medical needs, you're gonna to wanna to know, is there a nurse on campus? That's not always guaranteed. Um, some campuses will just have a nurse. Some campuses will have their own EMT squad. So you want to look into that and see what supports, if you needed it, would be available on campus. You may also want to investigate counseling and mental health services. Most colleges are really on top of this, but won't provide that information upfront as part of a college tour, or it's very limited. So again, you might want to go to that office, find out what they offer. And then you may want to do more investigations about student organizations so you know socially what will be accessible to you. You want to also identify and locate advocates and supports on campus. So before you make your final decision about a college campus, do they provide advisors? How do they decide who your advisor is? Can you meet your who might be an advisor for you before you make your final decision? 
Is there a tutoring and learning resource center that you can access if you're struggling with a particular class? What does that look like? How do they support you? And then if you're thinking about living on campus, ask about the residential supports. Is it something that's gonna work for you? If you're someone who socially maybe limits yourself, is there something built into the residential supports that makes sure students get out of their dorm room and uh, socialize with each other? Thinking about what your limitations are, where have you received support in your K through 12 education? And then seek out if there are similar supports on campus. They're not all gonna be labeled as being for people with disabilities. Like I said, many college campuses are providing this to all of their students. So you wanna investigate that, that from that standpoint. What's being provided on campus to all students? And what are your limitations and how can those supports meet your needs? Another big one um, is to determine how easily information can be found on accessibility um, on the, the website. Um, this is a good rule of thumb for life, but um, especially for a college campus. You want to check the website when you're on campus. You want to ask around the different departments that you're interfacing with. You want to review marketing materials, a student newspaper, and see uh, how frequently people are talking about accessibility. Where is that information? Is it easy to find? Does everybody know that there is an accessibility or disability services camp um, services on campus? Do they know who the people are? Um, CCM, here at CCM, the student newspaper did a whole uh, series, every newspaper, about uh, what it's like to go to college with a disability. If you were looking to go to CCM and you had a disability, that would be very encouraging. That would be a very good sign that it's a welcoming environment. Um, and so you want to look for those little clues that let you know, hey, we're here for everybody regardless of their status in terms of disability. So, Sean, you had to make a lot of big decisions your first year of college, right? Some of these things yeah. might have stood out to you. Um, who helped you make those bigger decisions in your first year of college? My, my, my support team. Who, who was that for you? Well, my, my mom, my mentors, and you. And how did they help you make those decisions? Well, we, we, we discussed it. I mean, for, for example, the, the biggest, probably the biggest decision I ever had to make my first year of college was whether or not to drop one of my classes I was having a hard time with. Mm -hmm. and I discussed it with, with my program coordinator, my mother during the monthly meetings. And how did we help you? Who brought up the problem to begin with? Who identified that you were struggling? I did. Right. And then how did your support team help you navigate that problem? We, we, we looked through the pros and cons of each option, which was to drop it or keep going. Yeah. And I think as one of the support people on campus and being the college expert in that conversation, what I thought about as I was supporting Sean is first, I listened to the problem. Um, he's the one that has to navigate it. So I want to listen to him and make sure I fully understand what the problem is that he's encountering. And then I know what his choices are. And if I don't know, I make sure I reach out to someone else on campus who will know what are your choices in dealing with this problem? What choices are available to any college student dealing with this problem? And then again, talking through the pros and cons of all of those choices. But at the end of the day, the decision was left to Sean, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he has, he has an open relationship with his mom. He was able to come to her and talk to her about it as much as he needed to. He had an open relationship with me. Um, and he was able to come and talk. And we were able to ask clarifying questions or provide more choices. But at the end of the day, we left it up to Sean. And you eventually decided to do what? To drop the class. And how do you feel about that decision now? Um, I, I, I'm very fast by that decision. I mean, I, I didn't want to drop the class, but, but so I said ultimately it was the best decision. Yeah. And so I think that's the process um, that most adults were supporting um, students in this situation is giving, letting them identify the problems, the difficulties they're having, giving them an open environment to do so, asking as many follow-up questions as you need to, 
providing informed choices, pros and cons of each of those choices, but at the mm -hmm. end of the day, letting the student make the decision on their own. So some other important considerations for college transition, again, many of these are going to seem very similar to any college student trying to make these choices. Some of it might be um, more specific for students with autism, but one big movement that's coming through colleges is something called universal design. So you are going to see some colleges on their websites, in their tours, talking about universal design or something that sounds like it. And universal design is about providing more flexibility in the curriculum or design of a degree completion program. So that might pop up on a college tour or on a website as a college toting their use of digital media in classrooms. Um, you might hear colleges talking about how they ensure learning opportunities are inclusive for all students. Um, so for example, um, we had a student here on campus who um, was taking a math class, uh, pre-algebra or an algebra prep math class. And if this student, the professor offered to all of the students in the classroom um, the opportunity to keep taking a test until they passed it. Um, so that's something that in K through 12 education is typically only offered to students with an IEP. But if in colleges, sometimes the professors, again, provide that to all students. So you wanna listen for those sorts of things, that sorts of language on the campus tour or See, look for it on the website to see that this college is approaching um, education as individualized already. In general, you want to look at the campus size. Um, it, it's super important that you choose a campus that's the right amount of students for you. If you feel like someone who would get lost in a very large campus with a lot of students, if your advisor was advising a hundred or more other students, um, you're not going to get as individualized an experience in a campus that's very large. You want to uh, look at instructional resources. How are professors teaching in the class? Is it very old school? Is the professor lecturing? Or is the college supporting professors and using digital media or other ways of teaching? You also want to look at transportation services, especially if you're dependent on your parents right now to get you to and from places in general. There's no more yellow school bus um, to get you to and from school. So you want to look at how easy it would be to use public transportation. Um, if you're still going to depend on your parents, how easy it is for them to get you to and from campus. Start looking into Access Link or Uber and figuring out what are your options for getting to and from campus, either every day or at least during breaks if you're gonna live on campus. And then you also wanna look again at the access to medical services. So some college campuses will have only one nurse who works on campus. Um, other ones will have full um, EMT squads, as I said. So you wanna really look into that and see if it'll meet your needs. Then you wanna look at their academics and pre-employment. Again, going back to size. Um, what is the class size, especially of those intro induction courses that you're required to take in your major courses of instruction. If you're someone who's really passionate about art, um, you don't wanna just look into what size a math class might be. You wanna look at what size the art class is gonna be. Um, so you know if that fits your needs. You wanna look at the type of instruction. Is the college using mostly professors who've been here a while? Adjuncts, those are typically people who are not full-time uh, professors. They are part-time. They're usually experts in their field, um, but are not fully um, employed by the campus. Or maybe it's a TA, a graduate assistant, um, who's a student themselves. So you want to look at that and whether that fits your learning style. And then you also want to look for a match between your career goals and programs or specialized services. And then, as we said, you want to make sure that you're looking at the social and independent living aspects. What are the housing accommodations? How active is student life? Is it going to, if you're someone who struggles socially, is it going to draw you out and push you? Um, and is it going to be something that's enjoyable to you? Look for extra support for freshmen or specific groups on campus to help with those things. 
So you want to know what your needs are right now. What are your K through 12 educators doing to support you that you're going to have to do use your support team and you're going to have to ask for this support on your own in college. And parents and team members, again, should take a supportive role in this decision by helping students research, asking questions about the bullets at the schools they are interested in. It's important, however, for the students to spend some time evaluating and making the final decision for themselves because they will need to experience the day-to-day -day life of a college student in a more independent way than what they experience in the K-12 setting. This is true for all college students, um, but you want to make sure that even if you're not living on campus, even if you're not going to be in a dorm, when you're here, you're primarily on your own in a way that you have never been in your K-12 education. So the final decision has to be up to the student. So we already talked about uh, this a little bit previously. Um, the student must self-identify to each professor. Um, they, the best approach is to give the form to the professor, then schedule an appointment to review the form, and alternate accommodations can be recommended or appro approved by the Disability Services Counselor. So you're not completely on your own in terms of academics, but you want to make sure that you have those forms filled out and you're working closely with um, Disability Services to get the accommodations you need. Um, we already covered the two bullets in detail, but one bullet that we haven't covered is FERPA. So FERPA is very similar to HEPA, which many students and parents have encountered in the health system. FERPA is uh, equivalent in the college setting, and it prohibits disclosure of student information to parents and guardians. So again, very different. If you call up your high school English teacher, the parent can call and find out what the grade is, why the student is getting that grade. In college, parents cannot call professors, they cannot call the dean of students, um, they cannot attend disciplinary meetings with the student, so a FERPA protects them. Many colleges have a way to get a FERPA waiver if you have a need that requires much more intensive support from your guardian. But again, you it's, college has to be independent, it's the way it works. So you want to try and navigate those things on your own and make a very careful decision before signing over your for both rights. And colleges are also very particular about signing over your FERPA rights. Um, and so sometimes they'll have you, you have to attend a meeting by yourself to get that waiver signed. And then also something to keep in mind is colleges are not funded to provide testing to identify students with disability. So you're going to want to make sure all of your testing is up to date before you leave the K through 12 setting. Um, disability documentation. So this just is a quick overview of what documentation you're going to need. Um, you're you're going to want to talk through your K through 12 district before you transition out to make sure that you have tests and documentation that meet these requirements. And if you need more information, you're going to want to go to the Office of Disability or Accessibility Services on the college campus you're interested in and find out more specifics. But this is just an overview. I'll give you a minute to look through it. So basically, the most important pieces of information you should know about documentation to receive services on campus before you transition out of your K-12 through setting is that an IEP or 504 plan or medical diagnosis is not sufficient. You need to have psychoeducational test documentation, and it must use adult normed instruments. That you also have to prepare yourself for the fact that different uh, there could be different accommodations based on the college setting than those that you may be used to from the IEP or 504 plan. Colleges do not provide retroactive accommodations. So if you decide to take a test without your accommodations, as I said before, that's within the right of the student. You can't, and then you get an F, you can't go back and say, oh, actually I was supposed to receive accommodations on that. You have to make sure you're making arrangements before an exam. 
then also we've covered this, colleges will not alter the fundamental nature of a course degree program of service. So that's, again, not do not need for uh, modifications. There's no accommodations in college. The most important thing you can do before you transition out of the K through 12 environment is to check in with your current case manager to see if the most recent evaluation used adult normed instruments and was completed recently. You want to have an evaluation that was completed within the last three years or maybe even the last year. Do it in the senior, the last year of the student's um, time there and request a new evaluation to be completed if necessary. Uh, sometimes we sign waivers. Um, you may have been offered to sign a waiver to complete an evaluation. Um, and so you might go back through your records and find out that the last evaluation you did was quite a number of years ago. Um, so you want to make sure that you're asking about that uh, well before the transition starts. So our final thoughts are um, just make sure that you're engaging in these conversations with your current IEP team. Now that you have been given this information, use your IEP meetings to start transition planning. Um, I've heard experts say start as young as 12 years old. Um, if college is something really important to you, you're going to want to start practicing a lot of these skills now um, and before you get to college. Make sure that you as the student um, are attending your IEP meetings and you start practicing listening to what decisions are being made in those meetings. You practice leading those meetings and you practice making your own decisions in those meetings. Make sure that you discuss reevaluation and documentation needs as part of the transition process. So make sure you're researching colleges and what they require and asking for those things before you transition out of your K through 12 system. Um, start looking in, and most high schools do a really good job of that, using the resources that are already in the community, such as DVRS and DDD, to help become a part of your transition plan and seek post-secondary transitional programs and support programs for college students with disabilities. Look for programs that will support what you need help with. Um, there's us, College Steps, but there's also lots of colleges and a growing number of colleges across the country who have, um, e who are either working with a nonprofit like us or have their own program specifically designed to supporting students with disabilities navigate these things on campus. Here's a list of a few additional resources if you're interested in learning more. And now we'll take questions. Thank you so much, Nancy and Sean. Uh, some questions came in, but you guys addressed it in the course of the presentation. So I want to thank, uh, thank you both and also thank everybody for listening. We appreciate your participation. The next NJ ACE webinar is on autism and safety connections for adolescents and adults with autism, and that will be on Thursday, August 29th. So please feel free to sign up on our website.